today, uh, today we're going to talk about two things, three things. I have problems with numbers sometimes. Uh, this guitar, which is about 90% finished with its restoration. It's uh, 83 Les Paul Studio, and I'll go over those details in a second. The Strymon Flint pedal, which is a new to me pedal, which sounds awesome. And also Tone Shop Guitars, I wanna give them a brief shout out. They haven't given me anything. I buy a lot of my stuff there, and they're an awesome local guitar store. So that would be number three. But if you're in the North Dallas area, and you want to check out a guitar that's less than $5,000, check out Tone Shop. They're pretty badass. Otherwise, go to Guitar Sanctuary for your five dollars to $10,000 guitar needs, if you have those. But, so, uh, on to the guitar. About a year ago, I started with this Les Paul Studio. Uh, if, I'm pretty sure anybody who would be watching this knows what a Les Paul Studio is, but if you don't know, the Les Paul Studio was a lower cost Les Paul model that started, Gibson started production in 1983-ish. Uh, and some of the earliest models like this one were made with alder instead of mahogany to keep the cost down. Uh, the Les Paul Studio, generally speaking, does not have binding on the body, doesn't use super high grade uh, flamed maple or anything like that. And from time to time, they use cheaper electronics and stuff like that just to keep the cost down. It's an accessible player's grade Les Paul that's still a really good Les Paul. And I think I read somewhere that the word studio is in there to indicate that basically no one would be able to tell in the studio whether it had triple binding or anything like that on it, as opposed to the other one. I like this one. It's really nice. It has an alder body instead of mahogany, which actually gives it a brighter tone, a little more like a Strat, but with humbuckers and uh, it j still has a warmer tone than a Strat because of the shorter scale length, thicker, more slabby body, shaped less like a cactus, more like a standard guitar, but I like Strats too. They're fine. Strats are fine. They're okay. Um, this project, the whole thing came without anything attached. Somebody took even the truss rod cover, which was pretty mean, and they took the tuners. There were holes from multiple tuners. Apparently somebody at some point was like, I don't like these tuners, so I'm going to put in some other tuners. So they added some more screw holes. And I have a set of West German Schaller tuners, which I could have put in here, which would be appropriate for the early 80s to have something West German in this guitar. But I would have had to put in another set of screw holes and I couldn't bring myself to do that. So I got some Grovers, some nickel Grovers. They're period appropriate and just installed them normally. Uh, the pickups, this model, probably most of them at that time period, had the Tim Shaw pickups. Everybody hated Tim Shaw humbuckers for a long, long ass time. Everyone wanted the Seth Lover humbuckers, the PAFs, and they wanted that PAF tone. Then at some point, somebody got a bug up their ass and decided, oh God, we just love these Tim Shaw pickups. So the price on Shaw pickups now, still a year later, is ungodly stupid for the fact that people were ripping them out and buying aftermarket pickups for a long time. So, at the time of sale, the pickups were worth more than the guitar. One pickup was worth more than the guitar. Don't know. But you could get about, about around then, around $1,200 to $1,400 for one humbucker and for a matched pair. People would pay stupid amounts of money on reverb, whatever. Anyhow, these pickups are from Pariah Pickups, a badass little company out of Detroit. It's one or a couple of people, small operation. I don't really know, I haven't been there. I've only ever talked to one person via email, but they are PAF spec mostly with a pretty PAF style voicing, which is just perfectly fine. It sounds pretty good. And then there's nothing at all fancy about the wiring. Hey buddy, how you doing? 
Yeah, you're a good boy. Uh, it was going to have some sort of fancy coil tab business or whatever. It does not. Why don't you go around that way? Yeah, that's a good boy. Oh, you are a good boy. That was unintentional. Um, it, that's really about all there is to it. There's a significant amount of lacquer crackling and crazing all over this thing, and it looks pretty sweet and antique. Oh. That's my dog. Good boy. Yeah, you're a good boy. This is Audie. He's my dog. He's a fun dog. Uh, okay, so that's basically everything about this guitar. I'll play it a little bit. But as you can see, it has a pretty mellow PAF type of tone on that guy and then on the other one. It's Just a real kind of a nice sounding Les Paul with sort of a more upper mid focus than a standard Les Paul and it's real light and it is also vintage because well things only one year younger than I am but it's a little bit prettier got a couple of things left to do on it and let's talk about the pedal all right, so the sorted tail of the strum and flint uh, tremolo and reverb. Actually, let me give a quick rundown of it. It's a two channel, two side, which has reverb on one side eh! and tremolo on the other. Tremolo, reverb. Each side has three different settings. Uh, on the tremolo, there's a harmonic tremolo, tube tremolo, and a photo cell tremolo. These are all digital, they're algorithms, but they're really good. Um, I'm an analog guy almost entirely, but this thing's just really good. It actually sounds a little bit better than the, the reverb and the bias trim on my Vox AC15 C1, which isn't the most legendary trim in the world, but it still sounds pretty good and pretty swampy. This thing can really get that, and it can push it through the Supra, which I like because the Supra does not have any effects whatsoever. Alright, so here's what we're doing. Tuner, not really doing anything. The compressor's off. Tube screamer's off. Sick as Mark 1 overdrive is on to give it some overdrive. But let's kick that off. Kick off that. Kick off. Come on. Secret preamp just so you can hear what it sounds like dry. This is center position. Rhyme and Flint. Uh, also, about a year ago, I bought a little silver tone amp from Tone Shop Guitars for around 300 bucks, which I then traded because it just wasn't the thing for me. But I got the Sick As and a couple other pedals, and then I ended up trading the other pedals, and those pedals I traded for the Flint. So now I have the Sick As and the Flint, which is a pretty sweet deal for. Roughly the purchase price of that amp, plus a couple of bucks, whatever. So, 
We switch it to the 60s, spring. You can kind of hear that sort of dark, murky spring dwell. And if you really max it out, it just gets kind of annoyingly drippy. Um, the 70s is some kind of plate, but the 80s is basically a quadruverb algorithm. And that's what I was playing for just sounding ridiculously. Just ridiculously 80s -y. Uh In the intro, it was the Tube Screamer into the Rat for pure 80s-ness because the Sick Ass is a fantastic Centwa clone and it Sounds really good and nice and transparent, but it is not an 80s overdrive. Or maybe it is. I don't know, whatever. Things are based on other things. However, give it a little slap back from the canyon. Just a touch of overdrive. some other time but basically that guy uh, on the tremolo side the harmonic tremolo is amazing I'm not sure what to do with it if it's almost unified the photocell tremolo is also pretty cool but that tube bias trem is the best for just a super duper swampy sound our filming rig today it sound is being recorded uh, through an SM57 that's going direct into a Zoom H6 recorder. We're not using any external preamps or outboard gear. The SM57 is placed off center of the cone of a 15 inch speaker on a Supra Thunderbolt Plus. And that's it, that's everything. And that's this going into the pedal board. If you liked the video, please give it a like and subscribe and we will see you next.